we'll talk about inverse, hyperbolic trig. All right, so I wanted to pull up, to start, I wanted to pull up uh, the graphs of the hyperbolic trig functions. And we're going to look at those. These are, I just pulled these straight out of the book. Um, but I wanted to look at these to, to start our, our little bit today. So those are our graphs. I don't want to make it too big. They get kind of blurry. Those are our graphs of our, our hyperbolic trig functions. So we can see, and we talked about this yesterday, they're not periodic like the regular trig functions. And all except um, Koch and Seach are one to one, so they pass the horizontal line test. So that tells us that they have an inverse. So all of these that are one to one oops, uh, would have an inverse. If we restrict the domain of the others, they will have inverse functions as well. And finding the, if once we talk about a function, finding the inverse function is kind of a, a natural second thing to do. You, you want to, you want, Mathematicians like to be able to figure out, well, if I have a function, what's, what's the inverse function? Um, and because hyperbolic functions uh, involve exponential functions, their inverses are going to involve logarithmic functions. So let me put, I'm just below here, I'm going to put a graph, the graph of the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. And these, the, I just pulled these, like I said, straight out of your, straight out of your textbook. There's the other one. So there are inverse hyperbolic trig functions. And these these you can look at these in your in your book if you want. So those are our inverse inverse functions. And you can see they they're all they're, both the, the regular hyperbolic trig functions and the inverse hyperbolic trig functions have asymptotes. And we kind of kind of suspected that because of the because of their relationship to a hyperbola. I'm gonna, gonna write, so on your sheet you have a list. For the first ones, I'm just gonna write, a, on the board, I'm gonna write a list of the, in, the definitions of the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. You have them on your sheet. If you don't wanna write them down, that's fine. I just wanna write them down because I'm gonna refer to several of them. And just so we, I wanna make sure we all see what they look like. Um, and we'll talk about how we come up with these, these uh, expressions for the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. So because, because all the functions are one-to-one, -one, if we restrict their domain, they have inverse functions. So inverse hyperbolic sine. I guess you could say cinch inverse. Is the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. And our Domain is minus infinity to infinity on this. The co inverse cosh of x is the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. Now, as I write these down, what this inside part, what does this kind of look like? Think about the integral that we did today. Doesn't it look like it would have something to do with sides of triangles? <coughs> Yeah. When we we'll talk about integrals, we can always use trig sub to do integrals that involve these kinds of quantities. Um, but what we'll see is that on some of these integrals that look that turn out to be messy trig subs, these natural logs are the ones where you have the integral of secant or cosecant, where you have the natural log of you end up with natural log of secant plus tangent or cosecant plus cotangent. Those things. That's where these natural logs come from. All right, so our domain here is 1 to infinity. We had to restrict this one, I believe. Uh, inverse tanch is 1 half the natural log of 1 plus x over 1 minus x. And this is on minus 1 
to 1. The cotanch inverse oops, is 1 half the natural log of <coughs> x plus 1 over x minus 1. <coughs> so this is just a matter of a, a sign change there. And this is minus infinity to negative 1, union 1 to infinity. Seach inverse is natural log of 1 plus the square root of 1 minus minus x squared over x. And this is on 0 to 1. And the cosich inverse is a natural log of 1 over x plus, this one is really messy, 1 plus x squared over the absolute value of x. And what you will see sometimes, minus infinity to 0, and we're going to union that with 0 to infinity. We exclude 0. What you'll see sometimes is You'll see this written, or you'll see this written. There, you can use them interchangeably. It really depends on the, 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 the context and the situation, which one that you will use. But when you see quantities like this, I'm hoping that after, after the lesson, you, that when you see quantities like that, that you think, is that an inverse hyperbolic trig function? And then you can go to your sheet and, and think about that. So we kind of go, you can kind of go back and forth. Because if you can think of it as an inverse hyperbolic trig function, that makes you kind of compacts all of this stuff and makes it a little easier to, to deal with. And these are all on your sheet again. We get these inverses from applying the definition of our original functions. So I just want to look at that for inverse hyperbolic sign. <coughs> All right, so all, all logarithms, all they're not particularly nice functions. Inverse hyperbolic trig functions are a little, a little on the messy side. All right, so let's look at inverse hyperbolic sine. So just to see how we get these. So sinh x is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. Do we remember the, our process, our procedure for finding inverse functions? Switch x and y and solve for y. So I'm going to write this as x equals e to the y minus e to the minus y over 2 and I need to solve for y. Any idea what we do here? Uh, OK, let's multiply by 2. That, that'll get, that's a start. 2x equals e to the y minus e to the minus y. Well, we. Because we have a difference here, we're going to have a natural log of a quantity. So that's not going to, that's not going to help us quite yet. There's a little trick that we can do when we have exponential functions that look like this. <coughs> I don't like that e to the minus y. Uh, uh, we're on the right track. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, almost. What would be the easiest way to get rid of the e to the minus y? How about multiply by e to the y? So I'm going to multiply everything. And this trick comes up a lot with these kinds of exponential functions. Multiply everything by e to the y. So I get 2x e to the y equals, when I multiply here, I get e to the 2y minus 1. Now I don't have that e to the minus y. 
Anybody see where we're going with this? This one's nice. I'm going to rewrite this. E to the 2y um, minus 2x e to the y. Plus 1, or minus, is it minus 1? E to the x minus, minus 1. I'm just getting everything on one side of the. Is that a y? Is it e to the 2y? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, okay. I got my tail. I got the tail a little long on that one. Yeah, that would have been black magic. All right, so there's e to the 2y minus 2x e to the y minus 1 equals 0. Uh, almost. You're on the right track, though. This is quadratic in e to the y. If our variable is e to the y, this is like um, e to the y squared minus 2x e to the y minus 1 equals 0. This is quadratic in e to the y. So we can solve for e to the y. If it factored, we could factor. But we have this my coefficient on this term is negative 2x. What's another way to solve a quadratic equation? Quadratic formula. So in the quadratic formula, I'm going to say e to the y. That's my variable, e to the y. That's what we're solving for. Equals 2x negative b plus or minus the square root of um, 4x squared plus 4, b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. And that equals, um, I'm going to leave this here, plus or minus the square root of 4, x squared plus 1, factor out that 4 over 2. And that equals x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1. Does that look familiar? <coughs> Let me go back. And then now to solve for y, which is what we were looking for, now we can take the natural log of both sides. And we get y equals, and I'm going to say natural log of x, and I'm going to choose the positive square root because we need a positive argument for the natural log. We don't want our, our natural log to be negative, so we choose the positive square root. And that is our inverse hyperbolic sine of x. So that's where all of those come from, is something similar to that. There might, some of them are a little more complicated than this, and you can kind of guess that by looking at their, at their form. But the, the, the process is similar. Switch x and y, solve for y. But this trick here of multiplying through by e to the y, that turns up often when you're dealing with exponential functions that they're like sums and differences of exponential functions like that. So that's a nice trick to keep in your back pocket and remember. All right, questions there. <coughs> um, so your derivatives, and which then give us our integrals of our inverse hyperbolic trig functions, come from taking the derivatives of these things. And then our integrals are just the antiderivatives of the quantities that we get. Um, so I'm just going to list, they're on your sheet. I'm not going to write them all. I'm going to list a couple of them just so we look at, the, look at the form. All right, are we good with this? This one's not, I really like this because we do this and we use a quadratic formula. It's a nice algebra problem. Um, so our derivatives.
and integrals. Because once we have one, we have the other. That's what's nice about, nice about calculus. So the derivative of inverse hyperbolic sine is, I'm, I'm going to write it like this, u prime over the square root of u squared plus 1, where u is some, can be some function of x. And the derivative with respect to x, I'll do the inverse hyperbolic cosine. The rest are written on your sheet. Is u prime, I think on our sheet they you say du dx. Um, the square root of u squared minus 1. Whoops, not 2. 1. What do these kind of look like? Don't these look kind of look like the derivative of inverse sine and inverse cosine? Mm -hmm. There's a sine difference there. Sine plus or minus. So when you see, that's the other thing about inverse hyperbolic functions, when you see something that looks like, sort of like a familiar inverse, inverse trig function, integral or derivative, but it's not quite, that should ring a bell in your head. Maybe this is a hyperbolic trig function because they're, they're really close, often they're really close except for a plus or minus. And if you look at the others, you'll see that it's very similar. Um, the inverse, for example, I'll do one more, the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic tangent is, whoops, this should, these should be u's, not x's, sorry. U's are, u is a function of x, is u prime over 1 minus u squared, where the derivative of the inverse tangent is, would be u prime over 1 plus u squared. So when you see those, that you should think, is this an inverse hyperbolic trig function, that are something that's close to an inverse, regular inverse trig function. That's the other thing that I, that I hope that you get out of this, is that, that you can maybe recognize that moving forward. And uh, often, uh, not often, but occasionally we'll do an integral. And I remember last year, the students, oh, if they weren't sure, they'd say, oh, is this on the inverse hyperbolic trig function sheet? That's a, that's a good thing to do. If it looks kind of familiar, but it's not quite. Um, and these come from taking the derivatives of each of these quantities. So natural logs, so we, we know how to differentiate natural logs. This one, um, you end up with a natural log and a quotient rule. This one, you end up with these radicals involved. So it gets interesting. The algebra gets interesting. But it just <coughs> comes from differentiating those things. And the rest of them are listed on your, on your sheet. But they're very similar. Our derivatives of the inverse hyperbolic trig functions are very similar to the derivatives of the regular inverse trig functions. So be aware of that similarity. And when you see something that's not quite an inverse trig function, think inverse hyperbolic trig function. <coughs> um, you also have on your sheet a list of integrals. And they're written in, so if we integrate these quantities, we get back to our inverse hyperbolic trig functions. And we can consolidate the integrals into basically three, three different forms. So I'm going to write those up, and I want to show the different, the, the different ways that we can express those. So is everybody, everybody good with our derivatives? Yes? Do we have to remember all of these? No. These, I, this sheet I would allow you to use. If you needed the hy hyperbolic trig functions or inverse hyperbolic trig functions, I would allow you to use that. Because it's, they are very, very similar to the trig functions, and some of them are very uh, messy and a little bit esoteric. But they're very useful. But I wouldn't know, I wouldn't expect you to memorize this. What I'm, what I'm hoping you get out of it is you see something that looks kind of familiar, but it's not quite, think, could that be a hyperbolic trig function? All right, so let's look at our integrals. Integrals come from just going in reverse from here, but we can consolidate these two. 
So these two are consolidated into one integral form, for example. I guess I should, maybe I should on the last page, I know it'll be on the video. I'm going to erase that. Eh, I can leave that there. It's okay. Integrals. So I'm just going to make a list. I'm listing three forms. du over the square root of u squared plus or minus a squared. a is a constant. And u is a function of x. A is constant. This equals the natural log <coughs> of u plus the square root of u squared plus or minus a squared. This is the positive sign is inverse hyperbolic sine of u. And the negative sign is the inverse hyperbolic cosine of u. So this form, this is equivalent, if this were a plus sign, to saying inverse hyperbolic sine of u. Inverse hyperbolic sine condenses this whole thing into that one little symbol. So this is very, and you can get this result by doing trig sub on this integral. You get this. So because of its form, it's going to be a, a cosecant integral, or sorry, a, a cosecant or a secant integral. That natural log, this would be the natural log of secant plus tangent or cosecant plus cotangent. That's where those terms come from. That's a messy trig sub. So if you can remember, oh, that's a hy inverse hyperbolic trig function. And then look at your table, you can save yourself a lot of work doing trig sub. The integral of du over a squared minus u squared equals 1 over 2a, the natural log, and bef the natural log of a plus u over a minus u. And I should say, let's see. Now, just looking at this one, a squared minus u squared, before I even write the inverse hyperbolic function, what, what, what are you going to guess? Tangent. It's going to be hyperbolic tangent, hyperbolic cotangent. Um, And it depends on, it's going to depend on uh, our domain and um, <coughs> I think it depends on our domain, which one it is. And then finally, our third form is the integral of du over u square root of a squared plus or minus u squared. And that's going to be negative 1 over a, the natural log of a plus square root of a squared plus or minus u squared over the absolute value of u plus c. <coughs> and the negative is the inverse each and the positive gives us the inverse cos each. So when you see something like this, this looks kind of like, and I don't remember off the top of my head the, the secant and cosecant integrals. Um, it looks very similar, but if it's not quite, then think inverse hyperbolic trig function. I know this is this stuff is a little little on the dry side, not not particularly exciting, but it's you will see these moving forward. All right, I want to go through one quick example 
of applying these integral formulas, just show you how you might apply them, and then I want to talk very briefly about an application of inverse hyperbolic trig functions. All right, let's say we had uh, this integral 2 over x square root of 1 plus 4x squared dx. I would look at this and I would say that's either going to be a trig sub or possibly an inverse hyperbolic trig, trig function. So which, which form does this match? Isn't it, like, isn't it similar to that third form? Similar to this one? Yeah, so we just plug in, substitute our numbers in and get right to here. So um, u is 2x and a equals 1. So I'm going to say we have the integral of du. I'm going to say u over 2, since we have that 2 in the numerator, of the square root of 1 plus u squared. And I look at that third form, and I'm going to say this equals, save myself a lot of work, minus 2 natural log of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus 4x squared, all over the absolute value of 2x plus c. Easy substitution from the table. You can get the same result using trig sub. Um, I made a video. It's called um, Calc 3 5.8 supplement for the trig sub. So you can look at that to see the trig sub for, for this integral. And you can always, always do trig sub. All right. Very briefly, uh, a curve called the track tricks. I'm just going to talk about this really quickly. So the track tricks is a, a curve in the, in the family of curves called pursuit curves. So we have a point um, P here that moves along the y-axis. So P starts at 0, 0, moves along the y-axis. There's a rigid connector of length A. So that rigid connector might be a rope. It might be a, a trailer hitch. So, um, and what we're doing is we're pulling um, pulls a point x, y. So that point might be, uh, you might be walking along a dock and you you're, you're <coughs> have a little uh, canoe out in the water here connected by this rope and you're walking along the dock pulling the, the, the canoe into the dock. Or you might be, this might be a tractor trailer, a semi that turns a corner and the trailer is going around the corner following it. Well that point traces a curve called a tractrix. And that curve, turn, it turns out that curve is described by an inverse hyperbolic trig function. 
So as we pull, this boat is kind of going to go this way, and it makes a little curve until eventually, when we go far enough this way, it's going to be following us. If the semi turns the corner, the trailer kind of trails along behind it, but eventually it's right behind the, right behind the trailer. So it turns out that the, the path is y equals a inverse hyperbolic secant of x over a minus the square root of a squared minus x squared. That curve describes the path of the tractors, a, an example of an application of inverse hyperbolic trig functions. I go through the derivation of this in that 5.8 supplement. It, t it involves uh, solving a separable differential equation. All right. Pursuit curves are really interesting, uh, interesting family of curves. I have, a, I have an entire book that's about uh, pursuit curves. All right, there you go.